I'd just like to start by thanking the organisers for allowing me to give this talk. Um, it's intended as a introduction to the idea of bootstrapping. Uh, if you're interested in this idea, then uh, please also see the talks by Anger and Donggang and Gordon, uh, who go into various uh, other details of this program. So uh, in this talk, I'll start by briefly reviewing the idea of uh, inflation, uh, what it is and uh, why, we, why we want to study it. I'll then uh, explain what the wave function of the universe is uh, as a slightly non-standard way of uh, understanding inflationary perturbations. Um, after that, I will discuss uh, the method, the bootstrap method um, before getting on to the specific implications of unitarity. Uh, and then I will end with some concluding remarks. So um, hopefully I shouldn't have to do too much work to convince this audience that uh, inflation is worth studying. Um, but uh, it's a, a phase at the start of the universe uh, where we had an approximately zeta expansion. Um, and during this period of the universe, there was some uh, unknown uh, but high energy physics that we would like to study, uh, which imprints itself onto this final boundary slice um, of this approximately zeta phase. Um, perturbations uh, on this final slice then grow uh, throughout the universe and then become all the structures that we see today. So um, these fluctuations then imprint themselves in the CMB and then large scale structure. Um, we can then measure things like the large scale structure, um, statistical properties uh, through their correlation functions, which then give us information about the correlation functions on this final slice. And therefore we can gain insight uh, into what happened during this initial inflationary phase through um, one day observations. This uh, inflationary phase uh, is interesting because it presents us a, um, a period of time where the energy was much higher than anything that we can possibly hope to probe today. Uh, and therefore we can learn about how physics extends beyond our standard model. Um, in particular, uh, if uh, potentially we get some insights into quantum gravity uh, or string theory uh, through understanding the sort of non-perturbative aspects of this regime. Um, and that's partly uh, what we hope to be able to do with this bootstrap method, uh, gain an understanding of this high energy completion uh, through the constraints imposed by various different symmetries uh, on, on the physics. So, um, I've talked a little bit about correlation functions, uh, but I won't be discussing those uh, anymore uh, in this talk. Uh, instead, I'll be focusing on what we call the wave function universe, which is defined through this path integral, uh, where which, which is evaluated on this final time slice that I described before, uh, and and takes also an argument uh, that is sort of arbitrary dependent on the field in this final slice. Um, and then we integrate over the field and its conjugate momentum uh, over this combination of uh, fields and the Hamiltonian density. Um, studying this whole, um, this object in its entirety would be very difficult. Um, and so we express it instead in terms of Fourier coefficients, uh, which we call the weight function of the universe coefficients. Uh, these are these psi n uh, in this expansion. Um, and they are simply related uh, to the more typical correlators uh, through uh, these relationships. And you see that they all depend on the real part of these correlators. Uh, and this is the reason why we choose to focus on the wave function coefficients rather than the correlators. Um, uh, we'll, so as we'll see later, uh, unitarity imposes uh, a condition on the analytic structure of these uh, wave function coefficients, which doesn't uh, generically uh, transfer to uh, correlators and therefore uh, from the perspective of um, the bootstrap procedure uh, it's much easier to understand how the wave function of the universe coefficients behave than it is for the correlators. Uh, there's also a second more sort of theoretical motivation in that these uh, correlation function, uh, these wave function coefficients uh, look like correlation functions uh, on this final time slice and therefore we can potentially hope to understand some uh, correspondence between the bulk uh, evolution uh, of these correlators 
uh, and the boundary behavior of the wave function curvatures, uh, just like we see uh, in antidesitter with the ADS CFT correspondence. So uh, hopefully uh, I've now convinced you that inflation is worth studying and the wave function universe is at least a way of studying it. The question is now, uh, how will we uh, calculate this object? So historically, there have been two main methods. Uh, the first uh, is to start with some fundamental principles, use them to construct a model, and then perform some calculations uh, and compute some observables. Uh, perhaps the most famous example of this uh, is Einstein, who started with the uh, principle that the speed of light should be constant and physics should be Lorentz invariant, and used those two principles to construct special relativity. And then from there, uh, combine that with the, the equivalence principle to give us general relativity. And then once we have general relativity, we can um, write down some Lagrangian uh, and then quantize the fields that are present and then calculate objects like, for example, this four point, uh, this two to two scattering uh, of gravitons. And this works very well um, when we have a specific model we want to test. So uh, for example, in, in the standard model, we can take all the symmetries we expect to find um, and come out, come out with uh, a general theory. But then we can test to incredibly high, high accuracy and um, that accuracy is borne out through experiments. Um, however, there are some issues with this, um, this procedure. Uh, first, uh, is that um, if we have a if we want to be more speculative with our theories, then we have to sort of calculate this in every single different theory, and um, that can uh, be a difficult task, uh, especially because this process of computing the observables uh, through Feynman diagrams uh, is actually uh, very difficult. Uh, and as there are lots and lots of different diagrams that we can write down and we have to compute all of them and then uh, find their sum. Uh, and the um, object then that we end up with turns out to be a lot more simple than this like individual diagrammatic calculation. So it seems like we're overcomplicating uh, the problem. Uh, and finally, and this one I guess is uh, slightly cheating, but uh, it sort of doing this calculation method hides the impact that the fundamental principles have on our observables. And so um, make, uh, I said cheating because that's going to be the procedure of the bootstrap, uh, but uh, from a theoretical perspective, this might be something you're interested in. And also if you want to understand how things behave uh, at uh, higher energies where we're not quite so sure about what the model is, uh, but we do still expect some of these fundamental principles to hold, um, understanding the impact of fundamental principles uh, could be of interest. And hopefully we'll have some constraining power on, on those theories. So um, instead of uh, doing this model-based uh, procedure, we're going to skip this step and go straight from the fundamental principles to the observables. Uh, and in the same case that we had before, this uh, general relativity case, uh, we take uh, locality, Lorentz invariance and dimension analysis, uh, and that can directly give us the result. Uh, and to see how these things uh, sort of affect this result. Um, we start with Lorentz invariance. That tells us that um, this object has to be functions of only Lorentz invariant uh, quantities. Uh, so these Mandelstam variables st and u. Uh, and also that we expect to be a symmetric function of them. Uh, and also that there is some invariance under rotating about the direction uh, of propagation of a graviton. Uh, and that's encoded through these spin helicity brackets, uh, which just gives us the correct scaling um, under uh, the little group of rotations around, around that direction. Locality tells us we can have at worst simple poles of um, uh, the Mandelstam variables. Uh, and then dimension analysis uh, forces us to take precisely this form because we need a function that depends on energy uh, uh, to the minus six power. Uh, and so the only sim uh, the only function, symmetric function of ST and U that has the correct structure is, is this one. Here. And uh, what this does is it, it helps when we don't have a single theory. If we can understand how these principles sort of impose themselves, then any theory with, that has those symmetries or those uh, properties will have observables in that form. Uh, 
Through its nature, it clarifies the link between the fundamental principles and observables, and therefore allows us to make some comments about, or potentially allows us to make some comments about higher, higher energy uh, completions of theories. Um, in particular, we can potentially gain some insight into non conservative results uh, or even positivity bounds. Um, and um, hopefully learn something about this, the high energy physics. Uh, and finally, uh, as you can see, we've massively simplified this calculation. So we've gone from having to calculate all the possible different fire, fireman diagrams to be able to just write down this single final result, uh, which is much more straightforward. So what are the fundamental principles that are necessary for us to perform a cosmological bootstrap? Uh, the first thing that was observed uh, is uh, that the amplitude is sort of hidden within the wave function coefficients. Uh, and this can be understood by uh, sort of thinking about if we take the interaction to have occurred in the infinite past, then the fields haven't felt any of the universe's expansion and don't know anything about the final boundary. And therefore, they uh, will interact exactly as if they were in flat space. Uh, and this means, uh, well, and when we take the little energy to be zero due to the bulk integrals having a e to the i uh, kt times time, uh, when we take the little energy to be zero, we isolate this point uh, in the infinite past and so recover the amplitude. Um, the second thing that was considered uh, was to look at uh, the impact of the full set of set isometries. Um, and this proved to be uh, incredibly constraining and powerful. Uh, unfortunately, however, um, this um, it turns out that this these full decentral isometries exclude some potentially phenomenologically interesting uh, models of inflation, uh, and so we have to go beyond those symmetries um, if we want to understand, for example, the effective field of inflation, where we allow us to um, break the set of boosts. Um, so uh, we need some different principles uh, to go by. Uh, one of the ones that was important in, uh, in flat space was locality. Uh, and so um, we looked to try and understand that. Uh, unfortunately, I'd say we don't fully understand what locality imposes on us. Um, but what we have instead is what we call the manifestly local test, uh, which is the requirement that um, our Lagrangian doesn't have any inverse Laplacians. Uh, at the level of the uh, perturbations. Uh, and this gives us this um, constraint on the first derivative of the wave function coefficient. Um, it might seem like requiring there to be no inverse Laplacians uh, just already is a uh, statement of locality. However, a fully local theory like a massive scalar uh, minimally coupled to gravity can give us inverse Laplacians at the level of the uh, perturbations to that scalar field by uh, through the solving of the constraint equations for the graviton. Um, just like dimensional analysis was very powerful um, in the flat space case, uh, we have a similar constraint coming from the dilation um, invariance of uh, De Sitter, uh, which is the scalar invariance constraint, which says that the wave function coefficient has to scale just like uh, the energy is uh, cubed. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we have unitarity, which I will go into slightly more detail here. Um, so uh, uh, unitarity uh, is often used in a sort of set of related but uh, distinct uh, properties that quantum field theories might have. Um, what I mean uh, when I say unitarity here uh, is potentially perhaps the most naive uh, meaning of unitarity, which is just that the time evolution operator is a unitary operator. So its emission conjugal, its adjoint uh, is uh, equal to its inverse. And uh, in perturbation theory, or well, writing this uh, time evolution operator as one plus delta u, uh, we can express this uh, condition constraint in this form, which will then allow us to make some statements in perturbation theory. And then we can sandwich this uh, in between uh, two states. Uh, and uh, this gives us uh, this relationship here. Uh, if this second state was an out state, this would look 
exactly like the um, uh, uh, the optical theorem uh, in flat space, uh, where this constraint is much more obviously interpretable as a relationship between amplitudes. Uh, however, in the sitter, each of these states actually differs uh, from a correlator, um, which would just be an expectation value of some product of fields in between uh, two in states. Um, and we choose these states to be uh, n-particle states uh, in the sitter, and then can express each of these terms uh, in terms of, or to some order of perturbation theory, in terms of um, um, uh, the wave function universe coefficients, uh, and then some analytic continuation. Because we don't have crossing symmetry, so we can't uh, necessarily rewrite these terms that involve permission conjugates uh, in terms of um, sort of uh, standard uh, wave function coefficients. And uh, the result of this can be uh, on a wave function coefficient can be seen diagrammatically. Um, where the left-hand side uh, is implemented as this discontinuity operator uh, that acts on some field and then cuts this internal line and then relates it to two, uh, the product of two lower point functions. Again, we have the discontinuity entering on this side as well. Um, and the importance of this constraint uh, is that it relates higher point functions to lower point functions and therefore allows us um, to sort of order by order um, uh, construct more and more complicated diagrams. Uh, and this result uh, holds for all loops um, and for fields of arbitrary mass and spin in any FLRW background that permits bunch Davis vacuum. Uh, so it's actually surprisingly uh, generalist. Uh, it's a surprisingly general statement. Um, so, uh, conclusions. Uh, we've made a lot of progress towards uh, understanding uh, the de Sitter wave function, uh, at least uh, in perturbation theory. Uh, in particular, uh, we've understood the constraints that locality, unitarity, and scale invariance pose uh, on our observables. Uh, and uh, Gordon goes into a little bit more detail about uh, how these things come about. And these results allow us to directly bootstrap uh, all tree level by spectra without reference. Uh, to a Lagrangian, as will be discussed uh, in both Angren and Donggang's talk. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and uh, I look forward to hearing your questions uh, in the discussion period.